First of all, I want to say thank you to everybody that put together breakfast this morning after sunrise service. I know that since I'm the only one standing, I may be the only one awake after that great meal. <laughs> but uh, this morning, if you would take those sermon notes with me, and if you would open up to Mark chapter 6, verse 9... I'm going to do a little different uh, this morning in our message than I normally do. You do not have any blanks to fill in this week. Rather, on this one page, you have everything put together that uh, I'm going to cover this morning. And what I've titled the message is Evidences and Implications of the Resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because there is evidence and there are implications, there are ramifications of the fact that Jesus rose from the grave. I saw this, uh, this quote one time, and I thought it was pretty good. There was once an atheist that asked a minister, Why doesn't your God come and physically show himself to us? And the minister replied, He did, and they nailed him to a cross. Jesus said that he was the Son of God. On Good Friday, we remembered that. We, we remember, if you will, on Good Friday, Jesus' funeral. That he suffered and died for sin on the cross. And the the cross is a reminder that our sins need atonement. That we have wrongs that need to be righted and only Jesus can carry the weight of our sin. But the hinge point and the linchpin of our faith is not the cross. The hinge point, the linchpin of our faith is Christ's resurrection. Because if Christ did not rise from the grave, then he would not have the power to transform us. And so this morning, we are going to look at some evidences of the resurrection. There is a ton of proof that he rose from the grave. And secondly, we are going to look at what some of those implications are for us who are believers. The first thing I want to draw your attention to this morning, and I'm going to take these first five points from Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20, as you can see in your notes. Those are the passages that deal with the resurrection in the Bible. And the first one we're going to look at is Mark chapter 16 and verse 9. And if you're there with me this morning, uh, if you would, would and are able, would you stand with me for the reading of the first passage of God's Word this morning? God's Word tells us in Mark 16 verse 9, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. Father, as we open up your word this morning, I pray that your spirit will have your will and your way. Father, open our hearts to hear from you. Father, for those of us who are believers this morning, I pray that you will remind us. Father, that you will equip us uh, with these tools from your word to be able to encourage someone else who perhaps is asking questions of who Jesus is. And Father, if there's anyone here today that does not know salvation through your son, Jesus Christ, I pray that your spirit will make clear who he is and what he came to do. We ask these things by the power of your name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. We, we see, first of all, that Mary Magdalene was the first one to see Jesus risen from the grave. And point number one there on the evidence of why the resurrection is true is that women were the very first witnesses. Now, we see Mary Magdalene was the very first witness But as we've seen in uh, Matthew this morning, as we had our sunrise service and even in Sunday school, we saw that after Mary Magdalene, her other friends, these other ladies, were the very first witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. Now here's the thing why that is so significant. If you were trying to concoct a lie of somebody having risen from the dead, you would do that by getting important, influential people in on your lie. That's how you would do it. In the first century, ladies were many times not treated very well, and their, their uh, witness and their uh, credibility was considered to be next to nothing. And so the very first evidence that Jesus truly did rise from the grave is that the Lord selected the first witnesses to be ladies who nobody in that culture would have believed. And yet they were the ones that saw the empty tomb, saw Jesus, and went and told the disciples who were hiding away, afraid, during this time. Secondly, the thing that we find in the resurrection accounts in the four gospel passages is that Jesus appeared multiple times after he was resurrected to the timid, hiding disciples. Every single last one of them ran when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and went to be sentenced to death and was crucified. They all were hiding out and afraid, They were not believing that Jesus was alive. 
They were afraid of what was going to happen to them because of what they had seen happen to Jesus. And they are hiding out. But another proof of the fact that Jesus rose from the grave is that they became bold to share the gospel and to spread the news that Jesus truly did rise from the grave. And every one of them, except for one, would die martyrs' deaths because Jesus rose from the grave. We see the disciples were cowards before the resurrection. But after the resurrection, Jesus transformed their entire life and his resurrected power gave them the confidence to share the good news that Jesus had risen from the grave. This is an evidence of the resurrection. Thirdly, we see that Jesus strengthened there. He strengthens the disciples and some of his other followers' faith with his word. If you would turn over with me to Luke chapter 24, we'll look at a couple verses here and see how he does this. And it's true that Jesus still strengthens believers' faith with his word. How does Jesus strengthen our faith today for those of us who believe in him? It is through his word. He's doing the same work today because he is alive, he is risen, he is not dead. Luke chapter 24, and if you would first of all find verse 27 with me, Jesus was speaking to a couple of men that were talking on the road to Emmaus during their traveling after he had been resurrected, and he said this, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, so the Old Testament, he, that is Jesus, expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. How did Jesus tell them that he was risen from the dead and that he truly was the Christ who would fulfill prophecy? He did it by exposing to them and explaining to them what scripture had already said about him. He built their faith with his word. We also see this morning, verse 32 of Luke chapter 24. Verse 32. Notice how they responded to hearing from Jesus. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he opened the scriptures to us? If you are a believer in Christ, have you had a moment or multiple moments in your walk with the Lord where your heart just burned within because the Holy Spirit was speaking to you he was showing you that Jesus truly is who he said he was. Jesus continues to do this for us as well. We go on in this passage. We look at verses 44 and 45. And he, Jesus, said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me, and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Jesus showed them who he was on the authority of God's word. He showed them countless prophecies that had been made hundreds of years before he ever came and were fulfilled to a T. And they were all prophesying concerning him. And he built their faith and opened their understanding. It's like the scales fell from their eyes to understand and comprehend what the scriptures had been saying. We also see in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, the way that God builds our faith. Here's how he builds our faith. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we want to hear from the Lord, we have to go to his word. It is the primary tool that God's spirit uses to build our faith. And so we see thirdly, an evidence of the resurrection is that Jesus strengthened the disciples faith with his word, showing how he had fulfilled prophecy, showing how he was the one that would come and suffer and die and then be resurrected all according to the scripture. And we know that Jesus not only did that for the disciples, but he continues to do that to the present day. Countless Christians today will tell you their own personal testimony, their own experience, that Jesus continues to use his word to build their faith. Fourthly, fourthly this morning, Jesus opened eyes to his identity that he was the son of God. When Jesus was going to the cross and when he was arrested and he was on trial by the, uh, the high priests and the, the Sadducees and also when he stood before Pilate, he is accused of many things and he remains silent. The only time that Jesus speaks in his passion is to say that I am the Christ. 
I am the Son of God. I am the one that was prophesied to come. Jesus told them his identity during his passion, but people's eyes were not opened until after he died. And the moment that he died and the earthquake happened, the centurion which was watching him said, truly this man was the Son of God. Jesus opens eyes to his identity. He did that back in the first century with the disciples, with the centurion, with countless others, and he continues to do it today. It's evidence that he is risen and that he is alive. Luke chapter 24, once again, we see a couple of verses here where Jesus opens eyes to his identity that he is the Son of God. Luke chapter 24, verses 30 and 31 say this, Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. They knew that it was Jesus when they saw him break the bread. Their eyes were opened to his identity. It is a supernatural work of the Spirit of God when the Holy Spirit shows us who Jesus is. And the Holy Spirit is the one that does that work. This morning during sunrise service, I shared with you a little bit about the testimony of Charles Spurgeon, a preacher of a couple different uh, centuries ago. And when he came to faith in Christ as a teenager, he went to a little church with a fill-in preacher that didn't know how to preach, Charles Spurgeon said many years later. But that man urged him to place his faith in Christ and look to Jesus. And Spurgeon did. He trusted in Christ as his Lord and Savior. Spurgeon would go on to lead many thousands of people to the Lord. He was a very mighty preacher, a very eloquent uh, preacher. But God saved him by simply someone pointing him to Jesus. The guy couldn't speak very well. But God saved him and the Holy Spirit supernaturally opened his eyes concerning who Jesus was and his need for Jesus' salvation. We trust In Jesus continuing to open eyes to this day of what his identity truly is, that he is the son of God and that we need him as our Lord and Savior. In Luke chapter 24, let us also look at verses 37 through 43. We have a clear uh, statement here, a story of what happened after Jesus was raised from the dead. One of the things that happened where he proves that he truly did rise from the grave. This is when he appears to his disciples. Verse 37. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. When they first see Jesus, they think they're seeing a ghost. They think they're out of their mind. We saw you die. We saw you buried. But what happens in verse 38? And he, Jesus, said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Look at the holes in my hands. Look at the holes in my feet where the nails were. It goes on to say, handle me and see. Touch me. Here, touch my hands. See that I'm flesh and blood. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Verse 40. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, they're dumbfounded. He said to them, do you have any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and he ate in their presence. Jesus proved that it truly was him by showing them his hands and his feet, saying, here, touch my skin, see. To doubting Thomas later on, he would say, look, look at the nail prints. Am I not who I said I am? Not only that, he puts away their doubts by showing he's not a ghost because he's eating food. Jesus opened their eyes to his identity and calmed their fears with the truth. Fifthly, this morning, fifthly, this morning, the last thing that we see from the the four gospel accounts is the fact that the resurrection is true. The evidence is in its favor because the resurrection account is told from multiple different angles. There was a homicide detective who wrote a book called Cold Trace uh, Christianity. He was an atheist and agnostic, and what he did for a living is he would examine cold cases. And he would get to the bottom to see what the truth was. And he'd look at all the different testimonies and corroborate the evidence and see what really had happened to cause these crimes to take place. 
And as an atheist one time, he, he felt a desire to go to the Scripture and see if the stories lined up that the resurrection was truth. And so as an atheist with a skill set of being a detective, uh, solving crimes and cold cases, he went to the Gospels and read the accounts. And one of the strongest evidences he came to the conclusion in favor of the Gospel was the fact that the resurrection was told from multiple angles. There were multiple witnesses. There was more than one person. You see, here's the thing. If you're going to lie about something, you have to get your story straight and you have to all say it the exact same way. But by raising of hands, how many people in this room have siblings? Okay, so if you have siblings, did you ever try to lie about something to mom and dad? I see people laughing. You had to get your story straight, didn't you? In order to try to pull that off. The very fact that the four gospel accounts have multiple people from sharing from their vantage point what Jesus did is a proof that this story was not fabricated. It truly did happen. Same thing if you see a car accident. The people that get in the car accident see from one perspective. Somebody sitting at a stop sign up the road sees it from another perspective. And somebody a quarter of a mile away sees it from another perspective. They all can report the same truth, but they see it from a different angle. Therefore, the fact that we have four different gospel accounts of the resurrection from multiple witnesses from multiple different angles is proof of its truthfulness. Secondly, this morning, if you would turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This chapter in the scripture is all about the resurrection and the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I have it broken down there for you. We're going to highlight several verses this morning in this chapter. I won't read the whole thing because it is 58 verses long for the sake of time. But we see seven truths of the implications of the gospel. We've seen some of the evidences. Now let's see what the implications of the resurrection of Jesus are for us who believe in him. Point number one in 1 Corinthians 15. The risen Christ is the object of our faith. Our faith is not in a concept. It is in a living person, Jesus Christ today, who is living and seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And one day, we don't know when, but we look forward to it because it can happen at any time. He will return and take us who believe home with him. The risen Christ is the object of our faith, the person of Jesus Christ who is alive. That is the object of our faith. Look with me in verses 3 through 8, if you will. Paul shows by many proofs that Christ raised from the dead. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James and then by all the apostles. And last of all, Paul says, he was seen also by me as by one born out of due time. Paul had beheld a vision of the risen Jesus Christ years later on the road to Damascus. His life as well was transformed by the resurrected Jesus we see here multiple evidences of why our faith is in the risen Christ. Number one, it's according to the Scriptures. Secondly, Jesus was seen by Peter. He was seen by the twelve. He was seen by over 500 people at one time. There is no way 500 people made up in a figment of their imagination that Jesus was risen from the grave. It just doesn't compute. It's not logical. It is a choice to say that it was all a farce. For those who claim that Jesus never was raised from the dead, you are making a choice on the basis of laughing at the evidence, not of trusting in the evidence. 
Not only the twelve, not only Peter, who had denied him, then became proponents of the resurrection and died martyrs' deaths, but Jesus was seen by over 500 at one time. And the greater part of them were alive at the time that Paul is writing this. He says the greater part remain at the present time, but a few have fallen asleep. That means there are hundreds of people that were among those 500 that were still alive when Paul had written this, and they would have been able to testify if he was lying. But they testified that he was speaking the truth. Jesus was also seen by James, his half-brother, and by all the apostles. And he was also seen by the Apostle Paul, whose life radically changes from being the equivalent of an ISIS agent to then becoming the greatest missionary that the world has ever seen because of the power of the resurrected Christ. Secondly, this morning in 1 Corinthians 15, we see that Christ's resurrection is the foundation of the believer's hope. Jesus' resurrection is the reason why we have hope. Look with me in verses 14 through 15, if you will. 14 through 15, Paul says it very simply. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and our faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found to be false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise if, in fact, the dead do not rise. Paul points out the obvious. If Jesus did not rise from the grave, then we are just all liars. We are miserable and hopeless, still wallowing in our sins. Paul points to that fact. He tells us that if Jesus is not risen, then preaching... And singing and studying His Word is all in vain, and we are self-deluded and deceived. I don't know about you, but I think it's a pretty egregious thing and a pretty faithless thing to say that thousands upon thousands of Christians over the centuries who have worshipped Christ, that everything they have done is in vain. If you reject Jesus, you're rejecting the testimony of those thousands of Christians who have come before you. You are saying that they are liars and that their transformed life by Jesus Christ is not true. The evidence is pointing all to the fact that Jesus truly did rise from the grave. He continues to transform lives to the present day. So if you reject Jesus and you reject His resurrection, you're rejecting the evidence. It goes on to say in verses 17 through 18, verses 17 and 18 of this same chapter. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ, have perished. It's all a lie if Jesus was not raised from the grave. His resurrection is the hinge point, the linchpin of our faith. He was resurrected. He had the power to raise his own life. And not only that, he will one day raise us as well. Thirdly, this morning, thirdly, we see that death has been and will be destroyed by Christ. Death has been and will be destroyed by Christ. Look at verse 21 and 22 with me. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. It's talking about two different men here. For as in Adam, the first man, all die because of his sin. Because he chose to rebel against God. He chose to do the one thing. And get this, he did it because he wanted to be like God. In Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve partake of that fruit and then experience their judgment, one of the temptations that Satan gave them was, eat this fruit because you won't really die. You will become like God and no good and evil. Adam and Eve wanted to be like God. They believed a lie that God was holding out on them. And they chose to rebel against Him and to take the fruit. And now, unfortunately, we have sin in the world. And we, as human beings, have not only knowledge of good, as God originally designed it, but we also have knowledge of evil. Why do we desire to have a knowledge of evil? It is the same temptation that we all face. In Adam, all die. In our sin, we will die. The wages of sin is death. But in Christ, all who believe shall be made alive. Jesus makes us alive because of his resurrection. 
And in verse 26, it tells us that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. One day, Jesus will completely do away with death on this earth. If you'll turn to near the end of your Bible with me, Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. We're going to see what Paul is referring to about death being destroyed. Jesus has already dealt with eternal death by making a way by his own blood and through faith in him to experience eternal life. But one day he will literally do away with death. Look with me in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, if you will. And then we'll go into the very beginning of verse of chapter 21. Pardon me. Revelation 20 and verse 14 says this. Then death and Hades, that's the present hell. When death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Chapter 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea. The Bible tells us that this world has death and sickness and disease and it, even the reason why we have heat and cold, scorching heat and the cold of winter is all because of sin. And the very creation of our world cries out for the redemption of God's children when Jesus returns because there will be a new heaven and a new earth. This world will pass away. The present heaven will pass away and there will be a new heaven where God comes to dwell in a restored Eden, a restored paradise with believers for all of eternity. There will be no more sea. There will be one landmass. We will all be together with Christ as our Lord. A new capital city, the new Jerusalem, will come down from heaven. This is what we as believers have to look forward to. But the Bible also tells us what will happen for those who do not know Jesus, whose names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life. They will be cast into the lake of fire along with Satan and his demons. It's said in verse 14 that death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. When Jesus returns and there is the new heaven and the new earth, there will no longer be death. There will no longer be this physical world. We will then be with Jesus for all of eternity in new heaven and new earth. So death will be done away with. The curse will be gone. No longer will this world exist. And not only that, not only will there be a new earth and a new heaven for these that we currently have will pass away, but the current hell will pass away. It says Hades, which is referring to hell, will be cast into the lake of fire. So here's what happens today. If you die and do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you immediately go to Hades and experience punishment for your sins. But the Bible says there will be a day when Jesus comes back and he sits on the throne and even those who are already experiencing punishment in hell will have to stand before him and give an account. And then they will be sentenced to an eternity in the lake of fire. It will be like experiencing a second death. Now, the best way I can explain this is the way my pastor explained it to me growing up. He talked about how there, if you are arrested for a crime and you get taken to the county jail and you're guilty, but you're awaiting your final court sentence, you are experiencing torment and paying the penalty for your crimes. But you are still waiting for your final judgment and the final verdict of court to then when you will be transferred to prison and carry out the rest of your sentence. That's what the present hell is like. It's like the county jail. It's still punishment, but it's going to be a whole lot worse when the lake of fire comes. Death has been dealt with by Jesus Christ and one day it will be completely destroyed. Do you know him? Anyone whose name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life, will be cast into the lake of fire. Scripture is crystal clear. If you will turn back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Fourthly, we see in this passage, denying Christ's resurrection is wicked and vanity. We are baptized symbolizing our participation in Christ's death and His resurrection. The reason why we go through baptism is as a picture of what God has done in us 
who believe in him. That our old life has died, we've been buried, and we've been raised to new life. That's what baptism is meant to be a picture of. If you look with me here in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, in verse 32, the second part of that verse, it says this, If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. What Paul is saying is that if Jesus did not rise from the grave, then how we live does not really matter. If he did not suffer and die for our sins, if he was not resurrected to new life by the power of the Holy Spirit, then just eat and drink and enjoy today because you got one life and tomorrow you're going to die. You know, the sad thing is many people have that view. You see it in movies, you hear it from the testimony of co-workers, perhaps even family. All they look at is that this life is the one chance they believe they have. Then once it's over, it's all over. So the only hope, imagine this, without Jesus, the only hope you have in this world is to enjoy today. Eat, drink, be merry, because tomorrow we may die. Only Jesus gives us hope for all of eternity. Only he has the power to do that. And he has the power because he himself has arisen from the grave. In Romans chapter 6, verses 4 through 5, Paul very succinctly here says what uh, he goes on to say in 1 Corinthians in the passage on this point. Romans chapter 6, verses 4 through 5. It says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be like him in the likeness of his resurrection. Not only do we look to the cross and see that our sin is what nailed him there and see that there is a penalty that must be paid and only Jesus can pay it for us. But we see the hope that Jesus did not just die for sin and stay in the grave. He was resurrected and because he was resurrected, you and I have the power to live a new life in Christ. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in everyone who believes. And we can walk in that newness of life as well. Back in 1 Corinthians 15, we find our fifth point. We find our fifth point. A glorified body shall be the believer's privilege as well. Jesus received a resurrected body. But did you know that as a believer, you will one day receive a resurrected body as well? That is a precious truth. It tells us in verses 36 and 37. Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. But what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be but mere grain. Perhaps wheat or some other grain. What Paul is saying here is he's using the illustration of springtime gardening to remind us of what our death in Christ will one day result in. I've already planted some of the seeds in my garden, and thankfully they've, they've survived all this frost we've got. The peas and the onions are doing just fine. But when I plant those seeds in the ground and water them, that seed has to die in order for new life to come from it. When we as believers walk with Christ, take our last breath on this earth, and to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, our soul goes to be with Him. But our body lies in the grave, like the cemetery, right out those windows. Our body lies in the dirt, and it begins to decay the longer that it sits there. It turns to dust, and other things grow from it. But one day, when Jesus returns, that body which has died just like a seed will be resurrected to new life. The DNA is already in there, just like the DNA is in a seed, because of Christ. Paul goes on to say in verse 42, So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. He goes on to say in verse 44, It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. We have the hope of receiving a glorified body just like Jesus for those of us 
who believe in his name. What a glorious blessing that is. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve eternal life. But Jesus says, not only will I forgive you, but you're going to share in my very life. The very things that are mine, he says, will be yours. You will also have this new life. You will also have a new body. You will enjoy eternity with me as well. You see, mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. It's not giving us the judgment that we rightly deserve. But grace is a whole other level. It's giving us what we don't deserve. And he is so gracious toward us. Sixth this morning, we see victory. Sixth, we see victory because of Christ's resurrection. Look with me in verses 53 through 57. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So that when this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then we shall be brought to pass the saying that was written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, I'm saved by the grace of Jesus, but I am still a corruptible man and I am a mortal man. And everything that I am will one day pass away and fail because I am weak. I am frail. He alone is strong. But because of Jesus, the scripture's prophecy will come to pass. Death will be swallowed up in victory for me as a believer. Death will not be a sting. Hell, Hades will not have victory for the believer because of Jesus. The sting of death is sin. Paul says it another way in Romans. The wages of sin is death and its strength is in the law. The law of God, the perfect standard of what's right and wrong, shows us that we cannot be good enough. Now, the law is perfect. There's nothing wrong with the law. When God says this is right and this is wrong, that's absolutely true, and it's still true. But we can never be good enough to receive from God what he offers us in Christ. Paul says, thanks be to God, to God alone, because he has given us the victory through the Lord Jesus. Graciously, the victory has been given to us by his power alone. And seventh this morning, seventh in 1 Corinthians 15, because of his victory, because of Christ's victory, because of his resurrection power, we are encouraged that our labor for the Lord is never in vain. Paul had said earlier on in this passage, if Christ is not raised from the dead, then our preaching is in vain. Now, it's very interesting what Paul says. Look with me in verse 58. He's been talking about the resurrection this entire chapter. And he says, therefore, what is that therefore, therefore? He's been talking about the resurrection. He's been talking about the implications and the truthfulness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then he moves on to say that because of the resurrection, therefore, there is something it should produce in us. My beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Catch what he says. Knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why is our service to Jesus and our labor in serving him and serving his body? Why is it never in vain? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because of the power of his spirit. Because he is the one who resurrects and brings life to that which is dead. So even if you find yourself in a season or a time when you are questioning and wondering if your service is making any difference. If what you're doing is bearing any fruit. Remember that because of Christ's resurrection power. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If you turn over with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in Paul's next letter to the Corinthians, he goes on to talk about the resurrection, but he talks about the resurrection from a different angle. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and there are three truths that we see here about the resurrection. He puts it real simply. Firstly, assurance of eternal life is in Christ alone. Our confidence and our assurance is only in Jesus alone. Look with me specifically here in verses 7 and 8. We walk by faith, not by sight. 
We don't walk by what we can see. We don't walk by the evidences and the seeming results of the world around us. We have to walk by faith. Over and over again, the Bible tells us not to fear, but to trust in the Lord. We are tempted to fear at times. We are tested in our trust at times. We must walk by faith and not by what we can see. He goes on to say in verse 8, We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Paul is reminding the Corinthians here that we must walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, as a believer, our heart cries out, Lord, I'd I'd like this journey on this earth to be done because then I can be with you. You ever felt that way as a believer? You look at the world, you look at the world spinning out of control, and your heart just begins to long, Lord, I just want to be with you and be away from all of this. I want to be in your presence. But we must be encouraged and reminded that because of Christ's resurrection, we must walk by faith and not by what we can see. One day, believers, we will leave this body. We will be present with the Lord. We look forward to that moment. We have confidence and look forward to that peace in his presence. But as long as he has left us here, it's because he has a work for us to do. He has the gospel to go to someone else, and he delights in using you and me. The Lord has chosen to use you and me to spread the gospel to others. We must walk by faith and not by sight. Secondly, in this passage, we learn that judgment day is coming. Look at verses 10 and 11 with me. Judgment day is coming. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known to your consciences. Paul points them to a reminder that because Jesus is resurrected, it's also a reminder that he is one day going to return. And when he returns, he is not coming as a suffering servant to offer forgiveness this next time. He is coming to execute judgment and establish his throne. There will be no more second chances when Jesus returns. We must all appear before him one day at the judgment seat, even we who are believers. Now, we as believers will not be judged to the point of eternal condemnation. But we will have to give an account for how we have lived in this life. The resurrection of Jesus should motivate us to live holy lives pleasing to the Lord. Because we one day will stand before Him and give an account for how we have lived our lives. And it tells us very specifically in verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Brothers and sisters, even we who are Christians should have a healthy fear of the Lord. We should tremble before Him. We should take our sins seriously because it is a grief to Him. It is a mockery to Him when we choose our sin rather than to serve His Son. And that is a battle the believer continues to have to fight. Therefore, we should have a proper fear of God. And knowing the terror of the judgment of that last day, we should have an urgency. The judgment day is coming. Not only for how we live, but it leads into the third point. We should have an urgency, therefore, to be reconciled to God through Christ, God's only Son. Look specifically with me at verse 15. And Jesus died for all, that all those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. The resurrection should not just be something that builds our hope, but something that motivates us to press on in living, pleasing to the Lord. And we are reminded in verse 17 of the reality, if you have trusted in Christ, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Our identity is different if we have trusted in Jesus. We are no longer the same person. Now, Paul tells us in other passages, our flesh does battle against our spirit, our old life has a battle with the new life that we live by faith in the Son of God. But the fundamental core of who we are, if we have trusted in Christ as our Lord and Savior, is completely different. 
We no longer can be comfortable with sin. We no longer can be satisfied living for ourselves. Because if we are in Christ, we are a new creation. The old life has passed away and all things have become new. So we see in this chapter that we have an assurance of eternal life in Jesus alone. We must walk by faith and not by what we can see. We are reminded that judgment day is coming and that should motivate us and it should result in an urgency to be reconciled to God through Christ, God's only Son. The question this morning is very, very simple. Do you believe the evidence of the resurrection is there? And we did not look at all of them this morning, but we looked at a fair amount of the evidences that Jesus rose from the grave. We have seen the scripture itself lays out the ramifications. If Jesus rose from the grave, then we owe all to him and must believe it is wicked and wrong to reject him. The question for us this day is, do we believe in Him? Do we believe? At the top of your notes, I included John chapter 20, verse 31. The end of the Gospel of John, John writes, These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Do you believe? Do you have life in His name today? In Romans chapter 10, Paul tells us how to become a Christian. And notice how critical the resurrection is in what he says here. Romans 10, 9 through 13. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For as the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. There's no distinction. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord, Jesus, is Lord of all. Bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Today, have you called upon his name? If not, I urge you to make that decision today. Because we're never promised tomorrow. We're never even promised we're going to make it home after gathering here today. He could return at any moment. You don't want to be found not believing in his son. Because he loved you and gave his life. This morning, before we are going to partake of communion and observe that, I want to encourage us to just take a few minutes. I'm going to play a song. And during this time, just do business with the Lord. Is there something perhaps that the Lord is convicting you of today? Is there a decision you need to make for Jesus? If you'd like someone to pray with you, I'll, I'll be standing off to the side. I'd be glad to pray with you. Or if you'd like to come up and, and kneel at the steps or sit in your pew. But during this time,